This is the 60th anniversary of Sega, the once console rival to Nintendo and Sony, and now one of the largest game companies in Japan, with a whole bunch of iconic franchises under their belt. This video is a compilation of 5 Sega videos on the channel, with the first being our video on Sega games based on a load of interviews we conducted with the veteran developers at the company. The Sega Mega Drive wasn't the company's first console, but it was certainly the most important. The console took the 16-bit microprocessor they were using for their arcade cabinets and adapted it into a home console, becoming the first successful 16-bit console at the time, two years earlier than the Super Famicom. At the time, they thought that games could become as popular as music, and so they designed the console to look like a cassette player, which used to largely come in black. And as a way of bragging about their 16-bit capability, they had it written in gold letters on top, something the director of R&D at the time admitted was pretty expensive. One of the things we remember the most about Sega in the 90s is that Sega does what Nintendo don't. During our interviews, Sega games creators consistently brought up the capabilities of the other consoles, with different developers having different rivalries. For instance, Masayoshi Kikuchi of Jet Set Radio fame felt he was constantly competing against PlayStation, and found that every time one of his games released, it was right next to a new Resident Evil title. This helped prompt him and the team to find new ways to take advantage of of 3D capabilities pushing the hardware to its limits. But at the same time, while Sega was influenced and prompted by their rivalries with Sony and Nintendo, those at Sega speak about a level of unprecedented freedom they were given to come up with their own ideas and be able to pitch them rather than just being told what to make. For instance, Sonic was made as a Mario competitor, but in actuality, Sonic plays nothing like Mario or any other platformer at the time, taking advantage of the Mega Drive to have him speed across the map. In this way, Chief Creative Officer Toshihiro Nagoshi refers to Sega as having the soul of an indie company. Likewise, Jet Set Radio was also a title that was unlike anything that had been made before. And it didn't even start as a gameplay concept, but rather it started with artist Ryuta Ueda waltzing up to director Masayoshi Kikuchi, pointing to a drawing he'd made of some characters, and was like, can we put these guys in a game? From there, a game about street culture, fashion, and electro music was born. It's the sort of game that marks the freedom of Sega, especially with Kikuchi's bosses giving him permission to put all of his other work aside to just work on creating the pitch. Those who used to play racing games on Sega consoles will likely be familiar with the work of Hiroshi Kawaguchi, composer of the OutRun series that has influenced a load of musicians since he started out in the 80s. But the thing is, Kawaguchi wasn't hired as a composer. In fact, he was hired as a programmer. He told them in the interview that he really wanted to make music, and also knew a bit of programming. But ultimately, they made him a programmer. But by the next year, he'd gotten familiar with designer Yu Suzuki, and they'd spoken about his musical experience. So, Suzuki gave him the chance to compose for the game Hang On, a motorbike racing title, and from there, he moved away from programming and moved into the music team, where he wanted to be from the start. But with that said, he has combined his skills to do music programming in the past. So it all worked out well in the end. The next video discusses the creation of Sega's most iconic mascot, now the star of his own feature film, Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic was originally developed based on a pitch to create something that would rival Mario. It was part of a long list of game ideas Yuji Naka had, and he'd put it furthest at the bottom, hoping it wouldn't be picked. Sonic went through many designs before settling on a hedgehog, with one of the earliest ideas being a rabbit. Only problem was that Yuji Naka felt that a rabbit would get hurt doing a somersault move, so they decided to go with the hard spikes of a hedgehog. A rabbit did eventually appear in the games though, in the form of of the unfortunately named Cream the Rabbit, who was first playable in Sonic Advance 2. 
Yuji Naka's history with Sega is one that's shaped by him trying to escape that speedy hedgehog. As previously mentioned, he didn't really want to make the first game that much, and he actually quit the company after development finished due to a low salary and bad performance reviews from those who thought Sonic would be a failure. Thing is, after he left, he was immediately contacted by Mark Cerny at Sega in the US, and he joined under the one condition that he wouldn't have to make a Sonic 2, a deal that Sega eventually went back on. In 2006, he finally managed to escape Sonic by creating his own studio and eventually joining Square Enix. After Sonic and Knuckles, the series had a bit of a weird time. The games released on the Sega Saturn weren't exactly what you'd expect, with Sonic 3D Blast being a mix of top-down adventure with 3D tube running, and Sonic R being a kind of weird running game, but not with the speed you'd expect. This was all down to the technical limitations on the Saturn, and the Sonic team struggled with this transition to 3D for a while. Therefore, they had their own feedback directly to the hardware team to make the Dreamcast something that could handle Sonic speed as he blasts through 3D environments. Clearly their message got through, with Sonic Adventure releasing on the Dreamcast shortly after the console launch. Sonic has been all over the place. He appears in Wreck-It Ralph, Smash Brothers, Lego Dimensions, and pretty much every Sega game you could think of. It's normal for these sort of appearances to be approved by the branding team at Sega, but as OKKO OK creator Ian Jones Courty found when he worked on getting Sonic and Tails into an episode of the show, the concept and designs all have to be approved by the Sonic developers themselves, who will pass back detailed notes about proportions and all the things you wouldn't normally consider. Unfortunately, when the live-action film creators were working on the original design, they managed to convince the developers that this was the best way of making Sonic look realistic. The image of Sonic today in 2020 is at least partially based on the US Twitter account, but if you ask the man behind the account, it's all about trying to bring back the edgy personality of the anti-Nintendo days. Originally, the account was very safe and corporate, but he took it further by engaging in meme culture, digs at other companies, and general silliness that rewarded the Sonic account with 5.8 million followers. The Yakuza series is one of the company's most critically acclaimed titles, telling a cinematic story in a world that feels real. Here's our video on the creation of the Yakuza series. Despite now serving as chief creative officer at Sega and producing a large amount of their most iconic games, before he joined the company, Yakuza series creator Toshihiro Nagoshi was just a film student who couldn't find a job. I relate. He decided to apply for Sega because one, he was a fan of games, and two, he seriously needed to be able to buy groceries. At the time, he had no experience in games creation and had no idea what to do. But here's the thing, this was during the start of 3D in games, and all these 2D artists had no idea how to work in the medium. Luckily, Nagoshi's experience in film meant that his camera skills came in handy for working a 3D camera in games. Since then, his experience in film has informed his treatment of the Yakuza series, from getting big name actors to having the cutscenes feel truly cinematic. At the same time, Nagoshi also wanted the world of Kamurocho to feel real, and an essential part of this was making sure that all the businesses that Kiryu walks past are real life brands. This was difficult at the start since the franchise hadn't really found a place yet, and most companies didn't want anything to do with them, and didn't understand why they needed their brand signage at all, no matter how hard Sega pushed. He details how one company promptly rejected them at the start, but five years later, they suddenly claimed to all be fans of the game and would love to work together. Due to the increase of popularity in the series, by Yakuza 5, they were collaborating with about 150 companies to represent them in Kamurocho. You might think that the sort of guy who created a game about Yakuza and fighting might be brash and reckless himself. But like Kiryu Kazuma, Nagoshi is responsible and thoughtful. Even though Kiryu does a lot of fighting, he never starts one himself it's always prompted by someone else. This is a part of Nagoshi's philosophy where he doesn't want to promote real world violence. And he feels that since his games take place in a representation of the real world, letting players start fights wouldn't be okay. He states that if anyone ever committed murder because of his games, he'd immediately quit the industry. He takes it seriously. 
but this wasn't the only part of Kiryu's character that influenced how you play the game. For instance, while the side stuff was silly, the main story had to fit the tone and character of Kiryu. After six games with him as protagonist, plus Yakuza 0, they started to feel these restrictions. This is why they had judgement set in Kamurocho, to show a different side of the city that Kiryu wouldn't see. And that's also why Ichiban Kasuga will be the new main series protagonist in an entirely different city. It's something entirely new to explore. Yakuza was never meant to do well in the West, and when it was initially released overseas, Nagoshi wasn't surprised that it didn't do well. At the start, they were hiring outside companies to do the translation, and the dialogue felt flat. So eventually, they moved translation in-house, working intimately on getting the cultural ideas and concepts of the script across in a way that doesn't just translate word for word, but instead translates the intent and ideas in a way that feels natural in English. The result? A massive sales boost, and a franchise with a following around the globe. After 10 years, the Sakura Wars series has returned, with the help of Bleach character designer Taito Kubo. This video explains just how they went about it. After the fifth entry's release in 2005, Sakura Wars was gone, but definitely not forgotten. Takahara Terada, the series planner, would make regular pitches each year to create a brand new entry. He'd always pitch around summertime, so his staff would joke that his pitches were the sign of the seasons changing. Each time his ideas would get turned down, until in 2016, Sakura Wars topped a Sega fan poll of the series they'd like to see make a return, followed by Jet Set Radio, Virtual On, and Shenmue. This provided a push, and that same year they managed to greenlight the first new main series release in over a decade. Similarly, Virtual On and Shenmue also got new entries in the following years. Just nothing for Jet Set Radio. Taito Kubo is a headliner for Sakura Wars, and with the Bleach anime returning, it's a really good year for him. He was asked to work on the game due to his experience in creating traditional Japanese clothing. And additionally, he was even asked to design the weapons as well, since he clearly has experience there. But he wasn't the only Bleach veteran that was brought on for Sakura Wars. You see, while manga artists make good designers, they're not used to creating designs that move. So an anime adaptation will always employ an anime character designer who will redesign the original drawings and show how these characters will move and express themselves. The Bleach anime had an anime character designer as well, animator Masashi Kudo, who stuck with the series for years. Because of his deep experience in adapting Kubo's work for animation, the Sakura Wars team contacted him after a recommendation from Kubo, and asked if he would help in turning these drawings into 3D characters. Generally, when an anime comes out after a game, we'll refer to it as an adaptation, but it's often the case where the anime was greenlit around the same time as the game. That's exactly the case for Sakura Wars. In 2016, while they were hashing out the details of the game, they also started planning a Sakura Wars anime. But instead of having them both tell the same story, the anime actually serves as the sequel to the game. The show is being made by 3D studio Sanjigen, who also produced the animated cutscenes for the game. There were times during production where they were worried that the game would end up getting delayed and people would end up seeing the series first, but fortunately that never came to pass. Except for English viewers, who can watch the anime now on Funimation, but still have a week to wait for the game. I've been raving about Taito Kubo, but they also took this opportunity to invite other guest character designers to create members of the game's cast. And these guys are pretty big deals. Among them is Bunbun Bun or Abachi, depending on his mood, character designer for Sword Art Online, his sister Yukiko Horiguchi, who designed the cast of k for Kyoto Animation, Shigenori Suojima, who designs for Persona, and Noisy Ito, who illustrated the Haruhi novels. So when Masashi Kudo was asked to get all of these designs from wildly different creators into the game, Game, he was worried that the world setting was going to fall apart due to the lack of consistency, but he succeeded in making the characters feel like they inhabit the world without taking away from the unique styles of these designers. Despite there being mechs in this world, it still does take place in 1940 in a fictional world where it was still the Taisho era. Therefore, they still needed some historical knowledge on the Taisho era regarding culture, clothing, and current affairs. Enter Takaki Suzuki, a screenwriter with experience working for anime as a military history and setting advisor. He's an expert when it comes to depicting history in anime and has worked on series like Girls on Panzer, Strike Witches, and Girls Last Tour. His 
job often involves using his research to supervise scripts, background settings and designs to see if they match up to reality where it counts. And he's taken on this role for Sakura Wars as well. So if you've got any complaints with the game's setting, send them his way. After years of waiting, the mega MMORPG Fantasy Star Online 2 has made it to the US, along with its years of expansions. Here is our video describing the philosophies behind it being brought overseas, as well as its development at Sega. One of the most notable parts of Fantasy Star Online 2 is that it is a free-to-play MMO. A lot of these don't usually last that long, but PSO2 has kept at it, with the only paid items being cosmetic. The game was created at a time where free-to-play mobile games were becoming a hit, but the team at Sega were disappointed that most of these didn't feel like a fulfilling experience unless you paid a load of money. So they aim to put their all into a comprehensive RPG and offer it for free. That is how they managed to capture players in Japan. Series producer Satoshi Sakai said that in five years, he hoped people would regard Fantasy Star Online 2 as being ahead of its time, and that's absolutely the case. Some of the paid items in PSO2 are the collaboration items. In fact, the first in the Western release was a Founders Pack with Sonic the Hedgehog themed items included. Fantasy Star Online 2 has had a massive amounts of collaborations over the years with everything from ReZero to Persona 5. A lot of games worry about these and will try and integrate collabs in a way that doesn't break the game's worldview. But since Fantasy Star is about travelling to different worlds with entirely different civilizations, it's pretty open. Sakai says that this is a game where anything goes, even if anything includes the girls from Yuri Yuri. Fantasy Star Online 2 is produced by the Online Research and Development Department at Sega Games. This was a team launched to find Sega a place in the free-to-play and online market, largely in regards to smartphone products. But often, they're so busy keeping up with existing properties that they don't have time to create new things. Therefore, they hold planning competitions with the staff several times a year where they will get an opportunity to present an idea. One of the ideas that came from this was Idola Fantasy Star Saga, a mobile game spin-off from PSO2. In this way, they can expand the universe with new ideas while keeping things going in the main game. When visiting Sega, Xbox head Phil Spencer mainly wanted to sit down with the Fantasy Star team. As a fan of the original title, he's passionate about the series and its influence on modern RPGs and wished it had more presence in the West. He was one of the many voices Sega heard asking them to release PSO2 in English. So when they'd finally decided to create an English release, Spencer offered them the chance to announce it on stage at E3. This was a huge deal, not just because of the wait, but also that an English release had been teased a long time ago, but ultimately canned. To make sure that wouldn't happen again, the Xbox head was able to get a look at the game running early on. Like many MMOs, the Fantasy Star Online 2 E3 announcement trailer was largely made up of the game's opening cinematics over the years. These are flashy animations created by Marza Animation, Sega's in-house film creators who recently created the Lupin the Third the First movie and helped out on the Sonic the Hedgehog movie. They are a highly in-demand team who work all over the industry. But of course, it's a lot easier to ask them to help out on your project if you're already working for Sega. Therefore, the studio created all six episode openings for Fantasy Star Online 2. Thanks for watching OtaQuest in Japan. Feel free to subscribe to find out more about the art and creation of Japanese pop culture.